Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk about something that's very much a work in progress today compared to some of the very beautifully polished finished stories that we've heard from, from other people. Um, can I just check my screen is sharing okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this, this piece of work is um, my adventures with a, a system called ALICE, which is a new plant cell based protein synthesis system. But before I introduce you to Alice, I'd just like to say a few words about um, where I work and the work that our uh, lab is doing. So I'm based at the University of York, which is in the northeast of England, where today it's a very wet and rainy day, but we do get some sunshine um, at times. Uh, and this is a, a, our most famous monument, the city walls and the minster. Um, I work in the biology department at the university in the group of Professor Ian Hitchcock, um, Ian is an experimental haematologist and our lab is um, working towards the molecular understanding of these processes that control the, um, the production of platelets, um, which I, I think we're probably all aware are, are rather important um, non-cells uh, in, in health and disease. Um, the master regulators of this process are a cytokine called thrombopoietin or TPO, um, and its receptor, MPL, or um, also called TPOR. Uh, MPL doesn't have any intrinsic kinase activity, so there's a third player in this um, game, which is Janus kinase 2, or JAK2, which binds to the intracellular tail of MPL and transduces downstream signaling. So um, recently it's been shown by our group in collaboration with um, Jakob Pilazav in Germany and also by other groups around the world that in the resting state, in the absence of cytokine, MPL and its bound JAK2 exist as a monomer at the plasma membrane. And then um, as the cytokine as thrombopoietin uh, is, enters the system, it's produced in the, the liver distant from its site of action in the bone marrow where uh, these um, receptors reside. Um, the thrombopoietin binds to receptor it has two binding sites and it brings two molecules of receptor together into this bridged ternary complex. And this um, dimerization on the outside of the cell transports across the membrane to bring the two molecules of kinase on the inside of the cell together into sufficient proximity that you get cross phosphorylation, both of the kinases themselves and of the receptor tails. Um, and this recruits other proteins to the receptor tails for phosphorylation and that's what triggers signaling. Um, there are a number of ways in which this process can go wrong and cause disease and um, understanding these diseases is an, another aspect of our lab's work. Uh, there are diseases that are caused by loss of function mutations which are distributed throughout the receptor. Many of these, in fact, I think pretty much all of them, the mechanism of action, if you like, is that less receptor gets to the cell surface. And when you have a lower receptor density, you get less formation of um, the active complex and less downstream signaling. And this re results in reduced numbers of platelets and a condition called thrombocytopenia. It's often a her hereditary condition, and this is very often fatal if untreated uh, at a very young age. Um, some of these mutations act by um, interrupting with the folding and secretion of the, the transport of the receptor, trafficking of the receptor to the cell surface. Others, the mechanism is less clear. Equally, there are a bunch of gain of function mutations, again, distributed without the throughout the receptor sequence. Um, and these work by a, a, a mechanism generally of um, constitutive dimerization in the absence of ligand. So even in the absence of cytokine, you get receptor chains coming together in the membrane, bringing together the JAK2 and downstream signaling. And here we end up with a raised platelet count um, or increased um, turnover, increased um, proliferation of the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow, um, resulting in chronic blood cancers, the second of which this primary myelofibrosis is almost invariably fatal. We know, uh, again, through work um, done with our collaborators using live cell microscopy, that these mutations in the transmembrane and juxtamembrane region work by stabilizing the dimer, receptor dimer in the membrane. And although we know that that's how it works, we don't know at a molecular level how that stabilization occurs yet. Um, and the other mutations 
the, by, the mechanisms by which they work is, is relatively unclear. Um, so you'll see that I've drawn um, this receptor as a schematic, uh, a cartoon, because there are no um, structures available for it in the public domain at the moment. Um, and there are several reasons for that. Um, it's, it's a relatively medium sized protein, I suppose, compared to what we've been learning about today. It's a bit too large and too flexible for X-ray crystallography. It's a bit too small um, for cryo-EM. Um, so what we do know from sequence is that the extracellular domain is comprised of, of two modules called cytokine recognition modules. The cytokine binds to the distal one of these, the further away from the membrane, so, and, and then there's a proximal domain. Um, each of these is further subdivided into two subdomains, one of which is likely to be immunoglobulin-like fold and the second a fibronectin-like fold. The immunoglobulin-like fold is held together by two disulfide bridges, um, and then each of the cytokine recognition modules is glycosylated in two places. So it's quite a complex um, system, not perhaps as complex as some of those we've heard about today, but it has its own challenges. <clears throat> then there's a transmembrane, single transmembrane helix, um, and what is predicted to be an intrinsically disordered tail, which probably folds upon binding to its various binding partners within the cell. So there's, there's homology um, between this distal region that binds the cytokine and related receptors, such as the erythropoietin receptor, and that allows us to build a homology model for this distal region. Um, we can assume that probably the, the next module has a similar structure, but the relative orientations of these two modules with respect to one another and to the membrane are completely unknown and may be important for function. So um, on top of the, those uh, characteristics of the protein itself, one of the other reasons that it's difficult to study and that there's no structure available at the moment is it's difficult to make. It's tightly, very, very tightly regulated in um, physiological expression for good reason, um, in that you don't want your um, the numbers of, of blood cells circulating to be dysregulated, that causes disease. And the main cell or non-cell on which it's expressed in the body, platelets, there's less than two receptors per square micron, which equates to around about less than 100 receptors per platelet. Um, so we worked out that if we wanted to make it from natural sources, we'd need the platelets, the full platelets for the entire blood of about six different people or, or one cow. It might be possible to obtain this using um, um, aphorized, expired aphorized platelets, which are kind of a concentrated form of the platelets from blood. And we, we did have a plan to do that, but that was disrupted for reasons that many things have been disrupted over the last uh, 12 months or so for everyone. The um, overexpression system that many labs use for doing functional studies on MPL, these B cell based um, mouse B cell cultures, even those express maybe a maximum of 5,000 receptors per cell. And, and again, very large quantities would be needed. So I've had a go at making intact receptor, uh, expressing intact receptor in insect cells. Um, this was very preliminary work. We could show by flow cytometry that a small number of the GFP positive, so baculovirus infected cells, did have receptor on the cell surface. And I was able to um, at least show expression in total cell mass by Western blot. But this is a very, very low level of expression and, and there's quite a lot of degradation. And I've no idea what the yield would be. <clears throat> so why go for a cell-free synthesis system when I'm working in a, a wonderful department that under normal circumstances, I have access to expertise, facilities and equipment all across the department. And, and I could do this in almost any expression system that I wanted. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, and as many of us know, over recent months, um, our movements have been somewhat restricted and we were asked for a long time, up until very, very recently, to basically concentrate on what we could do from our own benches. And for a while, all I had was my laptop at home. Um, and, and what I have at my bench, I can do molecular biology, I can do very small scale purification using my magic multi-pet system that has resin fill tips. I can do gels and um, a few other things, but I certainly didn't have access to the equipment to do large scale grows in Pichia or insect cells or anything like that. Um, and while we were at home, I was contacted by this company, Lenio Bio, 
um, who were looking for early adopters for their cell-free expression system they've developed using plant cells. So I thought I'd give it a try. So who or rather what is Alice? So I quote, Alice is a scalable, high efficiency eukaryotic cell feed protein synthesis. And what this means is they, they, the system is made from um, tobacco plant cells, which have been lysed, and they contain intact organelles, including mitochondria, so they can provide their own energy supply. Um, and they contain microsomal structures that uh, are then allow for the folding of complex proteins that need disulfides. And they also have all the mechanisms for doing your glycosylation at least N-link glycosylation. It'll be slightly different glycosylation than in a human cell because it's a plant cell glycosylation, but at least it does some. Um, so it sounded kind of quite interesting. And also because of the microsomal membranes, it means you can consider looking at integral membrane proteins. It's really, really simple to use. It's supplied as 50 microliter aliquots in um, two mil tubes. And essentially you take your aliquot out of the freezer, defrost it and add some RNAs free DNA. Um, and then shake it for 24 to 48 hours in a, a, at room temperature. Try to keep the humidity constant. Um, at the end of your reaction period, you add uh, detergent. So in this case, I used half a percent or 1% dodesalmaltoside, solubilize um, and, and lyse the microsomes and solubilize your protein of interest, spin down, take off the supernatant, do some affinity chromatography. And if you want to do this in multi-parallel mode, then you can use a, a plate-based setup as well, which is a, you can get away with 25 microliters um, of material. <clears throat> so it was, it was very, very, very simple. Um, you need to make your DNA in the right, uh, to, to put it with the, the right surroundings, if you like, to enable the expression in the plant cell-based system. You can code on optimize if you want to, I didn't. Um, I just took what I had in the in the freezer already in terms of, of, of gene. The plasmid that you can use with the system is that there's one for a cytoplasmic expression um, or the equivalent thereof. And I'm using the one that P Alice 2, which is for microsomal expression, so for membrane and secreted proteins. Um, <clears throat> it has a T7 promoter, then there's the five prime leader sequence of the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, this is followed by uh, your, where you put your gene of interest. The, 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 the vector contains a signal peptide, the melatonin signal peptide, a strep tag, a factor 10A cleavage site, um, yellow fluorescent protein, a six his tag, and then the three prime untranslated region. What I chose to do, which with hindsight and listening to all of the talks was perhaps not the most sensible approach at the time, was to clone my MPL in between the signal peptide and the his tag, because I knew from previous work that having a his tag on the C terminus was not likely to be functionally problematic. <clears throat> and I didn't at the time have access to treptactin redden, but um, I did have access to IMAG. And I looked at the, both the full length protein and also the ectodomain um, construct, because I know this can be made in mammalian cells and I, I was using it as a, as a comparator. So my very first um, expression test, if you like, if you can call it that, reaction test perhaps is a better word for it. I use the generic conditions which are used for um, cytosolic proteins. And here I'm showing gels for EYFP as a control compared to my full length and extracellular domain of my um, of MPL. I let the reaction carry on for 48 hours and I used five nanomolar plasmid. And then I added detergent to the whole reaction and solubilize that. Um, and I was blown away to be able to see, I hope you can also see where I've drawn these arrows, that there was a clear and, and quite strong band in my total samples for um, both the full length receptor and the ectodomain. Um, when you go in with an antibody and Western blot, the optimism um, goes away a little bit, I guess, because there's also an awful lot of smaller truncated products. And when I look at what's in the soluble fraction, it's nothing like what there is in the total fraction, suggesting that some of this or quite a lot of this is not perhaps correctly folded. And that's the same for both of, of these <clears throat> constructs. Um, so it turns out that particularly for challenging proteins and um, for um, um, membrane proteins, proteins expressed into the microsome in particular. Less is very much more. And I think this uh, is echoed by 
what some of what Chris and other people have said over these last few days that you need to tune your expression system so that it can cope with the processing and folding of the proteins that you're um, making. So I scale back to 24 hour reaction, um, after which point the microsomes start to be less happy. And I halved my plasmid concentration. And those are very much, pretty much the, the main variables that you alter with this system, apart from, of course, your, your construct as you might do with any other system. Um, and this, um, method I no longer, although I no longer see a, a strong band for the proteins of interest in the total sample, there is, I think, a band at about the right size for my extracellular domain in the eluted material from my IMAC column. Um, and when I look at my Western blots, it's not completely perfect, but I've certainly cleaned away a lot of the um, truncated products. And I now have two bands. Um, and I'll talk about where these two come from in a moment, which is, um, and, and there's more, certainly for the ectodomain, much more of the upper band than there was before. Um, I did a couple of other changes in this um, step, as well as uh, reducing the reaction time and plasmid concentration. I introduced an extra step of microsomal isolation um, before I solubilized, and, and I used a bit more detergent and a slightly longer solubilization time. And all of this, I think, has helped to clean up what I get off the column, although there's still a lot of contaminants. Um, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh oh, there we go. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, I get a, a doublet for both the full length protein and the extracellular domain. Um, and my suspicion or my hope, I guess, was that this was due to glycosylation. So I treated all my samples with Pingase F um, to look for N-linked glycosylation, which I expect on, on this protein. And uh, on the treatment with Pingase, I see my double band collapse to a single band um, at lower molecular weight. Uh, and interestingly, and in another demonstration of less is more, um, as I increase my reaction time and increase my DNA concentration, I decrease the amount of glycosylated protein as I'm overloading the system, I guess, and it can't cope anymore. <clears throat> so I've got glycosylated protein. Um, at least some of it can be solubilized in detergent. And the next step, as we've heard over the last few days, would be to show that it's functional. And I've used a number of different uh, methods to, to attempt to do this. Um, first of all, I made, so we have plenty of the cytokine in the freezer and it happens to have an N-terminal serine. And so I used a method uh, that's been developed in the chemistry department at York that's very gentle. Um, for labeling, site-specific labeling, the N-terminus of a protein that has a serine at the N-terminus with, um, uh, with, with a, a, an aldehyde-based probe. And in this case, I used a biotin probe. This method's called the OPAL method, organocatalyst. Um, oh, now I can't remember what the abbreviation is. Uh, organocatalyst protein aldol ligation. I think that's got it right. Uh, and, and this worked really well, and I got 99, 90, sorry, 98% um, biotinylation. Uh, and my, then my thought was that I would uh, bind MPL and TPO together and um, pull out the complex on streptavidin beads. Unfortunately, what I found when I did the pull downs was that even in the absence of, of TPO, uh, biotinylated or otherwise, the MPL bound to the beads anyway. Um, so although I did get pull down of my reaction products, I can't really say whether that's because they're binding to TPO or just because of non-specific binding to the beads under these conditions. So that's something I need to optimize. The next thing I tried was exploiting the his tag on the MPL to see if I could then pull down TPO onto my um, nickel beads, onto my IMAC column. And again, um, I do see TPO in my eluted material, which was encouraging. However, when I look at TPO alone in the absence of MPL, in the presence of 10 millimolar imidazole, which is what I used for this experiment, that's also binding to the beads quite happily, even though it doesn't have a his tag. Um, I can reduce that non-specific binding by increasing the imidazole concentration, but I haven't yet had an opportunity to check whether my MPL is still able to bind stably to the nickel resin at these sorts of levels of imidazole. Hopefully it will, and I can um, reduce the non-specific binding that way. The third method I've tried thus far is um, using chemical crosslinking with this compound called BS3, which crosslinks lysine residues or free amines um, on the two proteins in your mixture and also on, on the proteins themselves if they happen to form oligomers. 
Uh, and unfortunately, again, that's what's happening in that, although I do get higher molecular weight species uh, forming and visible by SDS page um, in the presence of the crosslinker, I get those in the absence of binding partner as well as in the presence of binding partner. So again, I, I can't really say whether or not the protein is functional. <clears throat> so lots of things to try. Um, our department is, is able to open up again um, now, and so I'm hoping I can get access to a, a suitable analytical size exclusion system to, to find out whether the MPL that I've made in this system is, is monodisperse and what oligomeric state it has. There's lots of work to do on the pull downs to try and reduce the non-specific binding and, and optimize what's going on there. I'm hoping to get access to a fluorescent label that I can use with the OPAL method to label my ligand to, to enable further assays. We have access to microscale thermophoresis and a plate reader for um, uh, thermal stability assays. Um, the protein that I have made needs much more purification. So it turns out that a number of the proteins within the cell-free system are themselves histagged. So using a histag wasn't necessarily the best way to go. But because my protein's glycosylated, I'm gonna go back to a lovely old method um, that was used for rhodopsin and see if I can get to enrich the, the glycosylated material on um, concannabinoid cephros. And then much longer term, I'd really like to try the system because you can, it, you have so much control uh, over what happens and what you put in. I'd like to use it for co-expressing MPL with TPO and JAK2 to make the full signaling complex. Uh, and then uh, there are a whole bunch of other wonderful ideas that this workshop has given me to try. Um, so thank you all for your contributions. So in summary, <clears throat> I've used this new plant cell based cell free system to um, make full length MPL and its extracellular domain. These are expressed into the microsomes. I can solubilize them with detergent. They're glycosylated, at least to some extent, and I can purify them partially with the hexastidine tag. Um, I think I'm being a bit optimistic here about the yields. I've done some recalculations. It's probably much less than a megamil, um, but that's still not bad compared to what we get in other um, expression systems. And I'm still waiting to find out if it's functional. So watch this space. I'd just like to finish by thanking um, everybody past and present in the Hitchcock lab, particularly my, my PI Ian for giving me support and letting me just get on with things really, giving me a lot of freedom to try stuff out. Uh, it's a cell biology lab. Um, and so we, we, we had a, a good time finding out one another's vocabulary and language and learning to speak this, the same language. I'd like to thank Tess for doing the flow cytometry on the insect cells and Gian and Sophie for being able to get into the lab on days when I wasn't able to get in to do things like rescue plates and put on overnights. Um, and then a lot of our work is funded by Cancer Research UK. So we're very thankful to them for funding. Obviously a big thanks to the folk at Linear Bio, Minak, Ricarda, Frank and Joanne for their technical and other support. Um, and then members of the biology and chemistry departments for technical support, reagents and, um, and their expertise, and Max in Osnabrück, whose um, figures I've, I've pinched for some of the introductory slides. Um, and I'll just finish, if I may, with a, a bit of, um, uh, of um, a promotion in that both the Hitchcock Lab and Lenio Bio are currently recruiting. So if you'd like to apply or you know of anyone who'd like to apply their skills to experimental hematology, or um, protein glycosylation, then please get them in to put, get in touch with Ian or Minac respectively. And um, thank you finally all very much for listening, for all your ideas and thoughts over the last two days. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks, Julie. That was a really wonderful talk. Uh, so we have some questions. Uh, why is MPL difficult to collect with X-rays? Um, so it's it's the um, the flexibility as much as anything else, <clears throat> as well as the very low expression levels. You just it's very very hard to make enough of it. Um, I think you could envisage trying to do crystal structures of the two separate cytokine recognition modules <clears throat> if you were able to identify the um, uh, junction between the two of them reliably. Now, what I haven't shown today because there, there wasn't time. I did a lot of screening early on um, in insect cells, looking at portions of the extracellular domain, the distal and the proximal cytokine recognition modules and trying to identify 
boundaries between them. And the best expression that I got was for the full extracellular domain and trying to make smaller subunits generally ended up in this folded material that didn't get secreted. So it, it, it seems, although it looks from sequence as if the two modules might be independent, I think actually structurally they, they, they need to work as a, as a unit. <clears throat> Okay, so the next question is, uh, how about adding nanodisks, malps, or liposomes to Alice? I'd love to try that. I, I'd really love to try that. I don't know. I, I'm guessing because you probably want to keep the microsomes intact through the reaction process that you want to put those in at the end as a, an alternative to solubilization. Um, but I definitely want to give that a go. Okay. So again, I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah, so another question is like, uh, why uh, like uh, Alice free expression system, uh, like do you run it like in reducing conditions? And and also do you see like correct disulfide bond formation in the samples? So um, as I say, I haven't been able to demonstrate functionality yet. So I can't say for certain, uh, and I don't have an assay that lets me look at um, whether or not the disulfides are there. However, the, the, within the microsomes, you should have an environment that allows for disulfide formation. So any protein that's produced outside of the microsomal compartment, it's unlikely that it will be properly folded, but protein that's produced in the microsomes, in theory, disulfide should be formed. Um, it's possible to make, so I haven't done this, but there's quite a lot of literature on using the system to make folded antibodies and they require, and other, um, proteins that require disulfide formation and that seems to work really well um, I don't have those data to to share with you today but um and as I say that that wasn't done by me that was done by Lenio Bio but that that works really nicely uh okay so one last question have you compared uh Alice with other eukaryotic cell-free systems I haven't um I don't know whether Lenio Bio have I think I, I know they've surveyed the literature, but I don't know whether they've done an actual experimental um, head to head. So I, I could take that question to them and get back to you. Okay, so thank you, Alice, for this amazing talk.